Yeah. So, welcome. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank okay. you. Okay. Let's start the session. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay. My name is Jaden. Together with me is Nifia. She's going to be the co-facilitator today. And we have uh, Olivia, we've got Brian, we've got Alexis with us. So before we start today's session, maybe let me just give a context as to, you know, why did we organize this plant clinic? So as you know, like this uh, pandemic has revealed certain cracks in our food system and like we have to start thinking about the way that we feed ourselves, starting from like the fundamental of how our food is grown. So we decided to come up with this Get Growing contest that is part of a Slice Robo Cafe. Uh, on you can find the profile on Instagram and Facebook. I can share it with you. So this get going contest is to get people to start growing their edible crops and encourage them to you know just keep trying and then you know as as part of the journey, some failures should be celebrated as well. So um, this plant clinic provides a platform for us to learn from experienced urban gardeners like the three of them, and uh, for us to grow some green thumbs, grow some confidence in gardening. So um, today's session will be the first of a few to come, we hope. And uh, what we can do is we can uh, use this to cover a few broad categories in terms of gardening. Uh, thank you all for submitting your questions. We've got like 38 questions or something. So uh, we try to group it, them into like broad categories and see how much we can cover. So the, for the first 45 minutes, what we can do is we can address some of these questions. Towards the end of the session, we can have like an open FAQ uh, segment. So if you have any questions throughout this session, feel free to drop them in the FAQ uh, tab over there. Yeah. So maybe for now, uh, I would like to introduce you guys. Um, I will do a short introduction of Brian, who is a student teacher in NIE. Uh, he's in the midst of training to teach the next generation, right? He loves gardening because it allows, it allows for him to care for the earth and care for his family, you know, harvest some fresh bay leaves, um, and he also dreams of writing a syllabus for MOE. So we hope for him to be able to achieve this dream. But meanwhile, he's contented to just write Instagram posts to educate fellow gardeners for now. Yeah, so um, next we have Olivia. She's a gardener, nature lover and believer of a sustainable society. So, so do we. Um, she writes about gardening and sustainable living on her blog, The Tender Gardener. Later we will share the uh, link as well and raises awareness uh, of environmental related issues through a non-profit organization called Green Drink Singapore. So follow her as well later, where she is the president and co-founder. So she's very much like a homebody and she likes to spend time in her garden, tending to her plants and fussing over her, uh, over her chickens. So Oliver, later, will you bring your chickens to show us? No, <laughs> they're, okay, not, cool. they're not show worthy, they're naughty. They're naughty? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and last but not least, we've got Alexis, who studied geography in NUS and worked for M Parks for three years. He spent uh, a year volunteering in Philippines, and he first heard about permaculture over there. He returned back to Singapore and worked for Edible Garden City for two years, and also he started the Center for Natural Literacy and Enterprise in partnership with NUS. And today he teaches permaculture and urban farming workshops. So thank you guys for joining. Uh, maybe you guys can share a little intro about yourself and, you know, what does urban farming or urban gardening mean to you? Yeah. Maybe Alexis, you want to start first? You did a little eyebrow raise. I think he has a oh, second. No, my, <laughs> my eyebrow raise was because I was caught off guard. <laughs> oh. That's the uh, fun, no, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I think you, you summed up my life pretty well. Uh, nothing much to add. Lah. I think, uh, but I really... Uh, I do understand that the, the gardening uh, process is probably a very long journey and the beginning part is usually a very steep learning curve. Lah. So hopefully this session will help everyone in some way or another to find some kind of uh, foundation or some kind of encouragement for the journey ahead. Yeah. So let Thanks. me know if you have any questions. Yeah. For sure. You have tons of questions. <laughs> yeah. But Brian, would you like to go next? You're below Alexis in my view. <laughs> Sure. Um, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm Brian, and I think like for me, um, this whole gardening journey has been, it has been really an adventure, la. So, um, for those of you who who aren't following yet, uh, my Instagram is Brian's Garden Adventures, um, and and that's really how I view it, to be. Um, I think it's it's really a lot about learning, and it's a lot about um being willing to fail, 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 fail and then have some small successes, and 
and learning to celebrate um, both the little and the big successes. Um, I think initially I had lots of romantic ideas about all the money I would save uh, by growing my own produce. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think, um, I think the more I've learned, I realized that you know, it's, it's not necessarily like the primary aim. I think if you are to save money, that will happen in the long run. But I think we also need to be willing to, to learn to invest a little in, in that, get some proper tools, proper soil. And once things are going, then maybe, you know, you start doing that. But more than any monetary value, I think it's the satisfaction of being able to, to feed my, my loved ones um, with, with quality produce, uh, which um, if you want to go and buy organic and if you have the funds, go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's a bit expensive. So I mean, learning to grow at home means you get fresh, good quality produce um, to share. So, and I think that's very important for me because I like to cook as well. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I will send you my address after then. Maybe you can send some produce <laughs> over to. Yeah. Okay, Olivia, you are next. Yeah. So, um, basically, I think urban farming uh, and uh, gardening in general is an exercise in uh, observation and really trying to, and it's, it's a lot of, of self reflection in the whole thing because when, you, you have certain expectations and then you find that, you know, life, you know, and, and the plants, right, don't go exactly how you want it uh, to, to go. And then you kind of like have all these past problems and uh, you have to really observe everything and then observe like, you know, the best microclimate for your plants, uh, the weather. And, and you know, it's, it's, also, it's a journey, I think, of connecting to yourself and, uh, is quite meaningful uh, and fulfilling. Yeah. Mm. I, I cannot say much because I've only started uh, five months or six months of gardening, soil gardening. But I think it's really like seeing your first like, like fruit or your first vegetable bloom and then consuming them. Like that's a, that's a really nice satisfaction as well. Yeah. So yeah. Nitya, I want to feature you as well. Nitya is a host of... Uh, this show on CNA called Edible Wow, whom I'm a, I, I'm a big fan of that. So Nita, would you like to share with us uh, a little bit about your gardening journey or like what, what are you growing currently? Um, so I think a lot of the time I've been very lucky to work together with experts who are, you know, really great at farming. Um, my, my primary expertise has always been in identifying uh, native plants and converting them into food um, and using kind of a lot of global South influences, right? So, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Olivia, of Alexis, Ryan, I've come to know recently and also love his work. And I'm, I'm really kind of grateful that they all exist in the ecosystem that we are in in Singapore. Uh, for me upstairs, I'm now trying to grow some ulam raja on my roof, sweet potato, lots of different kinds of ginger and turmeric. I'm quite lucky to have a little rooftop space uh, where I can do them in planter boxes. And I'm excited to put them in like, you know, I like to cook nasi ulam. I like to make all these dishes. Uh, I love moringa. So I've got a moringa plant upstairs. Uh, yeah, a moringa feta like quiche is something I really love to have for like Sunday brunch and stuff. Uh, so it's nice yeah. to see plants that you grew up with and convert them into a new way. Nice. Uh, Nitya recommended me this um, very amazing fruit recently called the noni fruit. And then she recommended that I pluck them and then put them in a jar and then ferment them and drink it. But when I, when I touch it, I just put my hand into the fruit and I smelled it. I almost fainted because it reminded me of like vomit. <laughs> It wasn't a prank. Like <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys tried noni before? Just to digress a little. Have you guys tried noni before? No, I haven't, but I know it. it's... It's okay. Yeah, I, I haven't, but I heard, of the repu I heard the reputation. I'm sure Alexis right. has tried it. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, enjoy it with blue cheese. It's not bad. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Maybe we can host a little tasting party <laughs> and then we can stream it online. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my, my former culture mentor was just saying it might make very interesting uh, pig feet because it's so productive and it grows so well. Pig feet? Yeah, so animal, animal, animal feet, yeah, but particularly pigs. But, but, I don't uh, know if the animals are going to want to eat the naughty <laughs> man. I have to be honest. <laughs> I don't know, man. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm, sorry. Uh, maybe let's dive deeper into like today's conversation. Uh, when when we were thinking about what to you know host for today, uh, we thought about perma the idea of permaculture. Um, I got to know about this term a few months ago through a friend. Uh, Michelle, I think she's in this conversation as well. She has taught me how to you know work with nature and things like that. Uh, deciding what kind of plants I should grow. So, uh, Alexis, I. I saw that you are uh, doing some permaculture causes. Maybe you can give us a, a short introduction on what, what is permaculture and whether or not like in a place like Singapore is land scarce. Like can we can we still apply uh, permaculture practices, you know, in our gardening from mm. day to day? Mm. Sure, I'll just give you uh, give everyone here a little bit uh, of an overview idea of what permaculture is. If you haven't heard about it, it comes from two words, permanent and agriculture. So the idea is that if you can design a farm based on uh, nature's natural patterns, okay, like how nature has always existed, then the farm will be able to take care of itself and then you will literally design yourself out of work. Club. So it's permanent agriculture in that sense. Um, that's a very simple understanding. I think when people think about it and they go online and they look at the resources that are online, usually people will first come across like really big farms uh, you know, places that don't look at all like Singapore. Okay, so a lot of people are also practicing it and it can get a bit messy or, you know, it's just, there are certain, there's a certain aesthetics to it, which are usually people associated with like the peripheral farms. So a lot of people always ask like, is it practical for urban places like Singapore? Uh, the answer actually is yes. Okay, it is applicable because permaculture is not, a way it's not one way of farming it's not like hydroponics where okay this is how you do it right um, it's actually a philosophy and it's an approach it's a systematic approach to how to design holistically um, so if you design if you think about it and understand permaculture from a philosophy and a ethical based um, uh, systems design way of farming, okay, right, some kind of structure that can help people think about how to design a farm and how to grow their own food, then you can say, you know, you can see the connections and see how it's applicable to any kind of situation, including the urban space. So uh, I'm quite excited to see how the conversation is going to go, because mm -hmm. all of us are living in an urban space and we're trying to take the thinking and the structures of permaculture and the strategies and try to see how they apply to Singapore. Of course, it will take tweaking, uh, but I think that's very much the fun of it. Mm. So thinking about permaculture and the types of crops that we can grow, uh, Olivia, recently you wrote a post on like the things that thrive well in our climate, be it vegetables and, or like fruits. Um, are there any things, any species or varieties that you would recommend us to grow like based on permaculture practice? Uh, like philosophy, you know, what really grows in our climate, you know, given that we have such great sun every, uh, all year round and also like nice rainfall. So what are uh, the few types of vegetables or like uh, herbs or like fruits that you vouch for and like encourage that everyone should grow in, in their homes? Yeah. Okay. So when I first started, right, I wanted to grow all the exotic stuff, right, all the Western stuff because I spent some time in Australia uh, and I have this... Uh, idea of what I like to eat um, but I found out through you know experience and also speaking to other urban farmers that uh, it makes more sense to grow something that is that thrives in our hot and humid climate and also like Alexis has also inspired me like you know I've seen his garden and he grows a lot of stuff that is uh, very uh, that, that basically is native to Southeast Asia um, and I mean, my uh, favorites would be uh, Malabar spinach. Mm. It grows really fast. And in fact, a lot of spinach uh, plants grow very fast, right? Recently, like Alexius passed me this uh, Chinese violet. <laughs> 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 I, do, I don't have to take care of it. It just takes care of itself. <laughs> and um, also, I know Brazilian spinach. I've not grown it, but I know that it's uh, very popular. Um, and even Madeira vine, uh, a friend of mine gave me a plant and I, I have so many of them now. So uh, I planted it mainly for the, uh, as a bee 
uh, attractant. Uh, and uh, it's, I guess, also another one of those plants, I don't have to take care of it. Um, mm -hmm. And then it forms these aerial roots and then it falls all over the place and then I have new plants. Uh, Bitter God is one of my favourites mm. to grow. Hey. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you can eat it raw as well as in a salad. It's so nice. Um, and uh, what else? I guess beans. Uh, I like I like uh, wing beans and yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of things we can grow actually. Mm. I tried growing wing bean, uh, wing bean once and then I think the seed started rotting. I don't know maybe like the ratio of water maybe I pour in too much water. Yeah, that's interesting. So do you have a lot of varieties growing at the moment, Olivia? Like do you do you generally pick crops that will just thrive without um much maintenance in general? Um, okay, so I have a couple of different areas. There's one area that is very hot, super hot and is like in a con like it's surrounded by concrete. Uh, in that area, I, I grow all the uh, super hardy plants, which would be the bitter god and the vava spinach, Madeira vine, uh, things like uh, okra, things like the eggplant was doing quite well in that area. I mean, certain certain because there are certain I, I still use shade cloth though so uh, because it's so hot um, and then in the other part uh, I have this more open grassy area uh, over there I grow other stuff uh, and well, what do I grow there so I have uh, taro because it's quite sunny as well so I grow some more of the root, root stuff like uh, sweet potatoes and then I have a veggie pot so in that that's where I grow all the spinachy, uh, uh, lettuce type of stuff, all the green leafy stuff. And uh, yeah, uh, I just have to, I mean, it's a lot of trial and error, trying to figure out where to plant it. Because um, initially when I planted things in the hot concrete area, uh, it was just doing very badly. So then I realized I had to push it cloth, you know, so it's a kind of trial and error process for any gardener. What about Alexis and Brian? Do you guys have spe uh, like varieties that you would recommend um, fellow gardeners to try out as well? Um, I think I, I second, I second uh, Olivia's recommendation to go with Malabar spinach. So I'm not sure what the name is, um, but Malabar spinach is, is basically like a spinach alternative, right? So rather than struggle to try and grow a, a cooler weather crop like spinach itself, uh, things like Malabar spinach. Um, the other one that I really like is Oh dear, that well, was really nice. Okay, sweet potato. Like different varieties of sweet potato, I think, are fantastic, right? And, and I think the, the amazing part about sweet potato is that you've got edible leaves as well as a tuber crop, right? A root, root crop, so to speak. Um, and, and both are edible, right? And even if you can't get the potato seed, then, you know, fantastic, lah, and then treat it like a potato, lah, right? Rather than a sweet potato. So, I mean, just learning to be adaptable. Um, I think another thing that I really, really like um, to grow so far, uh, oh dear. I suddenly my mind went like, oh yes, mulberry. Mulberry is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Multiple edible crops as well from a single plant, which is another kind of like big thing in like the permaculture uh, kind of idea, right? You want to stack functions. Any, any element in your system ideally should have more than one function, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of pollinator support, uh, or class them Lucy, but in terms of pollinator support, um, I really like growing um, anything in the amaranth family. It means things like our local spinach, bayam, um, any of the weedy stuff you find, you can pull off some seeds, it's fantastic. In Chinese New Year, we have uh, those feathery, feathery kind of, um, they call it plumed coxcomb. Um, those are the, oh dear, internet connection unstable. Uh, plumed coxcomb, that's another uh, very pretty looking one that the bees love. Uh, and then lastly, uh, under pollinators, I would say, sorry, two things under pollinators would be um, anything in the basil, anything basil -y, right? Anything with basil in the name. Or uh, recently I just discovered sesame seed. If you can find raw sesame seed in the supermarket or, or in a mama shop, um, buy the black ones. Try both, but the black ones so far have sprouted better for me. Uh, I've only just sprouted, but I'm quite excited about that. Yeah. Mm. How about you, Alexis? Yeah, I, I would add, uh, I mean, of course, in, we, we, had, we have gardens with like 100, 185 over plant species that are edible. 
Um, so the list is endless uh, because we're in the tropics. But I think the quick advice on where to start is probably go check out um, the local wet markets. Okay, the, it's a great place. If you go to the local wet market, go and look at the vegetables that they are selling there that are not really that popular. They tend to be the ones that do really well. <laughs> okay, so like all your money tie and all these kind of things, you know, ask them, oh, yes. talk to the people, see where they come from. If they come from Malaysia, it's usually a good place to, to start. Okay, so check out those uh, vegetables. If you can, go to... Um, the cultural uh, wet market, so the ones at Geylang Serai, go to Little India, okay, you will find a lot of plants that you can just kind of grab and do stem cuttings. Uh, and those are the kind of plants that will do really well in Singapore, most of them, 70% to 80% of the time. Okay, just put them in water, you'll start to see the roots coming up. So if you're already a beginner, you know, try to go and explore the local scene and then take some of those things and try it at home. Nice. Uh, we talk just, yeah, just, briefly, just very, very, very briefly as, as much as I can. Um, I think another very important thing if you want to learn to grow yourself is uh, something that Olivia said, right? Um, try, to, try to kind of, it, it involves, necess, necessitates, uh, I think, a change of mindset, a kind of paradigm shift. If you really want to be sustainable and you want to kind of uh, be able to grow very healthy vegetables, oftentimes that means you need to uh, or at least in the long run, uh, switch over to varieties that really thrive here, as opposed to varieties that are really going to struggle very much in our climate. Mm. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, once you grow it, then you eat it also. Because if you're just going to grow edibles but not eat them, then you might as well be growing yeah. ornamentals. Right? For sure. Which is not necessarily mm. a bad thing. Like I said, that's the kind of understanding that I've had um, over the about four or five years that I've been growing. Yeah. Mm. Something that I realized that in terms of uh, getting seeds and all that and to be self-sufficient in resources, right, is that I find that, personally, I find that there aren't a lot of seed suppliers in Singapore. I, I, might, be, I might be confused or I might not be aware. Yeah, so one of the questions that pop up also is uh, where, where, where can we find seeds? Where, where can we buy uh, like gardening equipment in, like, locally? Yeah, we've had quite a big share of... Uh, beginner gardeners with less than a year experience. I think 70% of us, we are, including myself. So maybe if you guys can uh, point us to the right places to look for seeds and to look for equipment, that would be really nice of you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so personally, actually, uh, I used to bring in a lot of my own seeds when I go overseas. Um, but of course, the risk of that is that it's not uh, acclimated to our weather. So... Uh, mm. You can get seeds in a lot of nurseries, but the seed viability varies. So um, I would say that uh, I, on Carousel, actually, you have some good options. Yeah, I think yeah. uh, I've not tried steadfast seeds, but they seem to have a you know, good reputation. Uh, mm. Weird and wonderful edibles. Uh, she, she is very particular about uh, you know, having a good crop of seeds and good quality seeds. And she, uh, you can, I mean, her progress, you know, you can see online uh, what, what uh, the, the, whole, the whole process is like. So uh, I would say that her seats are quite, are pretty good. Uh, and uh, locally, we have uh, Gorilla Seats that brings in the Frenchy brand seats from Italy. And, uh, but those are very expensive. Uh, if, you, if you look at it, you know, when you buy it, it's like nine ninety for a pack or and upwards. But you get, but actually, it is cheaper when you weigh it. You realize that they have a lot more seats for what is worth. I mean, what 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 it's priced at. Um, and we have also um, this uh, the seats master. They have seats. Uh, I I I buy from them sometimes, but I typically go for certain seats like. Uh, they, they are specialty seeds. Yeah. Um, I, I don't buy all my seeds from there. It's, it's a bit pricey. And uh, I've had some seeds that have not been viable. Uh, yeah. But uh, also, I would, rec I, would, I would suggest seed swapping uh, mm -hmm. because seeds can be very expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over to the other two. Yeah. Uh, to so do... Oh, yeah, sorry, just yeah, sorry. I mean, to, to give context to the, the idea of seed swapping, I think mm. one of the cool things about gardening is that um, as you grow plants and then as some die and, and then some survive, right, if you end up saving seed uh, or propagation material from the plants that do survive, these are often the plants that 
um, for whatever reason, are better adjusted or, or acclimated to, to our Singapore conditions, uh, which are hot and wet, right? or, or wet and hot. Right? Um, so uh, that, that tends to be a very good way to start um, your gardening journey because rather than try to grow a sweet potato that's, you know, to be today's example, but rather try to grow a plant that, that is like borderline, maybe can grow in the tropics. If you have someone who has generation on generation saved um, these seeds, which have already adjusted to our weather more or less, right? And that's a very good way to get a plant that's uh, more robust and that's going to cope a lot better with, with, with our, our weather and climate conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think one of the cool initiatives I've seen on the various gardening pages I follow on, on Instagram is that um, in some countries, what they've done is that uh, for these more established gardens, they set up little um, stations outside their garden, right? Offering free seeds. In Singapore, that's not necessarily the best move because the, the weather will basically bake the seeds. Uh, but that kind of idea, I think, if we can set up some sort of infrastructure for, for seed swapping, that would be a very good idea. Lah. Like, I have a little bit, I, I donate to the pool, and then I, I, I think they call it like a co-op kind of concept. Oh. Lah, right? mm-hmm. uh, a group, uh, one of the groups which I know does that, um, or used to do that in, in person, would be the Fo- Foodscape Collective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, that's F-O-O-D, Foodscape, like landscape. So Foodscape Collective which is a bunch of people who are just interested um, in, in the idea of, of food in Singapore and what that means, both uh, growing and, 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 and the cultural meanings of that and, and all of that. So that's another good way to, to join uh, these groups, uh, which exist on Facebook. Uh, yeah. mm. Alexis, if you have anything to add. Uh, I, I would say two points. Probably you can try Ban Li Huat, which is a company that I think we all know. Yes. Uh, Ban Li Huat <laughs> is a very local company. Uh, third genera- three generations old. Um, they have very good uh, seeds that you can buy in bulk. So if you're doing like microgreens and stuff and you need a lot of seeds for a cheap price, then Bani Huat is a good place to start. Um, the other thing is, of course, kind of similar to the seed um, swap idea is go and check out um, just your little gardening plot that's below your HDB or your house. You know, Just walk along. Anytime you see like a little place that's growing something, just try to be courageous and try to say hi and, and get to know the people. And then when you get seeds or stem cuttings from these gardens, you know that they are the freshest seeds. Mm-hmm. So uh, um, I got most of my things just from talking to people and, and, and swapping that way. So that's a good strategy to start with also. Um, I just, yeah, I just, I just yeah. wanted to add as well. Um, another thing that I do is, so if I order anything from like local permaculture or organic farms like Fireflies or Green Circle, um, I'm a bit cheeky and I will write in and I'll be like, you know, if you have seeds that from your crops that have gone to seed, right? So like I got sawtooth coriander seeds from Fireflies, for example because they had it just growing like wheat and he just sent it to me. You harvest the seeds, you plant them. Um, you can get Ulam Raja seeds that way. You can get uh, Moringa pods uh, because they just have an excess of it, right? So, and you are supporting the farms, you're buying crops and you know it's growing right now viably in a place that's just in Kranji. So that's mm. another way to like hustle some seeds as well, I think. Mm. Really like the idea of exchange and I think through that we can get a lot more varieties introduced amongst the community in Singapore. Yeah, mm-hmm. maybe we can move on to the next topic. Uh, some people are quite interested on, you know, I think uh, how do we actually create the ideal soil mix for our plants to grow? Because um, at first, like when I first started, I just used one type of soil for everything. And then my friends say, hey, you're going to kill it. Like rosemary, if you use normal soil, you will kill it. Yeah, so Alexis, I, I saw that you were doing like specifically soil classes as well. Are there any key considerations when we, we have to think about catering like our soil to uh, different plants? Is that, is, uh, and maybe to think about it in a more sustainable way, um, do we have to think about, okay, this plant, this specific one, and then mm. do like 180 mm. variations or are there certain uh, principles that we can just remember and then we, okay, let's try this formula. Yeah. Mm. So, Tell us a bit more about how you uh, think uh, about it. A, a quick note is, is uh, soil is a, a rabbit hole. Uh. It's a very deep rabbit hole. Uh, I, I was introduced to soil science basically when I was in N Parks and there was a professor, a PhD person that taught about soil science and he taught a three-day course. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about nothing but soil for three days. Okay, so, and that was eight times three hours. Um, 
So it's a, it's a, there's a lot of information there and it's never ending. Uh, my recommendation is go and take a soil class, like just find some time, find, uh, find some, set aside some money and invest in this area of knowledge. So go and take a proper soil class, get some basic fundamental uh, concepts and understanding that will place you on a very, very good understanding of how you should start. Uh, if you want to understand uh, just quickly for this discussion, there are three main components of soil that you need to think about when you want to get or create good soil. Always think about first your structure of your soil, which is how soft, how, how hard, you know, is it crumbly? Okay, it always has to have good ventilation. Okay, so you're looking at crumbly, uh, well-ventilated, well-drained soil. Okay, so those are, you need to look at components within the soil that can produce that kind of uh, structure. Then you need to look at um, whether the soil has got enough mineral components. Okay, so do they have um, rock dust? Do they have volcanic sand? All these things. Okay, these are the ones that will provide long-term mineral components that will provide the, um, the, the, the taste to your plants, right? And the health of your plants depend on these minerals. And then finally, it's like, is there a good uh, amount of compost or organic components in it? which will provide mainly your N, P, and K, which are needed for fast uh, plant growth. Okay, so three components, look at the structure, look at the mineral content, and look at the nutritional or compost content of the soil. Uh, there are many brands out there that have different mixes. Okay, um, my, my suggestion is don't get, uh, don't get too loyal to one brand, okay? <laughs> Learn the science of mixing a soil. Okay, because how, what kind of soil you need will depend on what kind of plant you're trying to grow. Okay, so understand where your plant is coming from. Is it a Mediterranean plant? Is it a tropical plant? Is it a subtropical plant? What's the kind of soil foundation in that place? And then after that, try to bring components together like baking, right? You got to bring in the flour, the sugar and everything in the right components to try and recreate that soil that came from that original place that the plant came from. Okay, so a lot of us tend to kind of just go NTUC or cold storage and buy the pre-mix, okay? And then suddenly that company closes and the brand is no longer there and then we panic, all right? <laughs> or we go to a nursery and then we try to find one, uh, we ask them for soil and then they provide us with like 10 different brands of soil to choose from. Okay, so what I encourage is go take a class, understand how soil is supposed to feel, uh, how it varies across the spectrum. And then after that, so that when you buy a brand of soil, you can open up and you can look at the soil and you can tell whether it's relatively uh, suitable for your plants or not. Uh, it's a huge rabbit hole, um, but it's so exciting. Okay, you can go on and on about it, um, but really the, get your foundations right in terms of knowledge and then after that, see whether you can mix your own soil if that's possible. Mm. Yeah, I'm ready to jump note, into that. Yeah, please, yeah. Oliver. Yeah, yeah on that note, uh, I think uh, beginners will find it very confusing when they first go to the nursery mm. uh, and they see, wow, what is this topsoil? What is this volcanic soil? What is this burnt earth, right? So I think it's worth actually finding out all these things so that, uh, yeah, because uh, during my workshop as well, people say to me, hey, I bought this burnt earth, I mixed with this, but then like, uh, you know, it, it didn't quite work. Uh, what's the problem? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm we're sure Alexius learning. gets this a lot. Yeah, we get it a lot. And we also make our own fair share of mistakes. You know, like uh, if anyone tried to grow lemongrass, I tried to grow lemongrass. Uh, I grew my lemongrass in fantastic soil. Uh, all the compost, all the goat manure and all that. And then after within three days, they die. And then everyone's, you know, telling me it's so easy to grow lemongrass, but then I can't even grow lemongrass, right? So the reason why is because uh, lemongrass likes very, very, very poor soil very sandy, very clay soil, you know, you can, you can scold it, you can pee on it, it will survive. But if you give it good compost, it will die. Okay, so <laughs> make sure you know what your plants need. And then after that, you will be able to cater the soil for it. That's so funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. If, I, if I can yeah. add to that. I think, broadly speaking, I mean, again, not because it can be very detailed and, and there is some merit to, to being very scientific about it. There is some merit to it. Uh, I would say a few things. I think one is understand, do your research, right? Understand where the plant comes from, okay? So if you've ever been to, let's say, the, the, the hillsides of Spain, right? You see rosemary, right? Growing like a, like a, uh, sorry, like a, like a weed, 
<laughs> right? It, 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 is, it is ridiculous. Rosemary, you go, over, go overseas, right? You get like these Christmas tree looking shrubs, huge plants, right? And, 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 it, and like, oh, wow, you know, I'm going to grow rosemary like that. No way. No way. Are you going to get away with that in Singapore? It's very, very tough. Okay. But it's also to understand that that's the kind of environment it comes from, right? Poor soils, blazing hot sun, but also much drier. So beyond the soil, it's also the climate, right? So if you understand where the plant is coming from, then you kind of design broadly, at least at first in broad strokes, um, a soil mix that is suitable that, for that plant. So if you're dealing with plants from the Mediterranean, like uh, Alex just mentioned just now, right? Things like rosemary, thyme, oregano, sage, right? Um, you want something that's super well draining, right? We can't control the climate. So you're trying to make sure that the roots themselves are in an environment which uh, it allows water to pass through quickly instead of staying there, where it gives them the equivalent of athlete's foot, right? Xiang Kang Xiao, right? A fungal infection that just destroys the root system. So mm-hmm. that would be the first thing, like, understand where the plant comes from. Uh, the second thing I'll say is just, um, broadly, I would say there are, I mean, for the beginner gardener, I, in my mind now, I just thought of this in the last two minutes, I would say they are like the normal, sorry, they are the Mediterranean plants, which want to be very generally much drier and with very well-draining soil. They are your water plants, which basically uh, either grow in the water or on the water side. So you want super kind of uh, waterlogged almost kind of soils, right? Because that's the environment they like. And then loosely, that will be everything else, right? So like the, the normal plants, so to speak, right? These are plants that will do generally okay. And then maybe the fourth one will be plants that are like pioneer plants. So pioneer plants are plants which usually will go and colonize soil that no one else can grow in, right? That will be things like the lemongrass uh, and typically like your bean, bean looking trees, right? So like tamarind and, and so on and so forth. So I mean, once you have those four broad categories, right? If you know roughly where those plants fit in under that, then you can start designing a mix. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that uh, most people think that gardeners grow plants, but I think one of the things I've learned over my four or five years gardening should come in six, sorry, uh, is that a good gardener grows his soil, not his plants. The plants are a bonus, right? And what does it mean to grow soil is basically to, to care for it. We can speak a little bit about that later, but also then um, to take care of the microbial life in there, right? What are the teeny tiny things in the soil that are often you can't see, right? Um, that do the work for you. Uh, people think that, that one of the, the biggest lies that, that agriculture has fed us, right? Uh, because of an accidental discovery, probably, is that you need to till the soil. It means you need to like, kind of mix it up and crack it up very often. Uh, but the fact is that right, if you walk in the forest or you walk into a grass field, right, naturally, that, that's naturally occurring. Nobody does it, right? but you see the soil is fantastic. It's nice and crumbly. Right? It has structure, like Alex just said. The reason why that happens is that things like earthworms are doing the work for you. Right? So why would you want to do back-breaking work of breaking up your soil every day when you can learn to enlist the help of these uh, microbes and, 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 and things like earthworms and all that, right? So, yeah, I mean, so take care of your microbes. Uh, they will take care of your, your plants for you. Yeah. We have a question. Uh, what is your opinion on tilling? Yes or no and why? Yeah, this one I have no idea. So you guys take over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I just yeah, answered that actually. Yeah. yeah. Hey, oh, yeah. hell no. No. Um, <laughs> I think, no, I mean, okay. Uh, based on what I've, I, I used to be very dogmatic about like no means no, yes means yes. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize context as well. Uh, in Singapore, a lot of the baseline soil, right, is going to be kind of very clay. So if you are fortunate enough to have access to like one of those condo, condo grass patch or a community garden that's in the ground, right, the baseline soil is going to be very clay. Now, in that case, in that case, right, such a context, that right, context matters so much. Um, an initial kind of till drop to loosen it up enough for your plants to sink their roots in might have its place, might have its place, right? So, um, so yeah, it, just an initial one. But you must understand that each time you dig up the soil, right, the reason why you get that burst in, in fertility and in growth, right, is because you are, you are turning over all the microbes, all the bacteria and fungi and earthworms, right, and exposing them to the sun. Them dying, right, is what gives possibly the soil that first boost in growth. The minute they die, right, nothing is keeping your soil from kicking up and becoming like a, like a block, right? Like a piece of pottery, especially if it's all clay, right? So if at all, till once, after that, figure out the ways to keep it from hitting that, that rock solid cement sort of stage. So yeah, uh, perhaps at the start, but after that, subsequently you go for 
um, methods. Like you can look up things like no-till or no-dig gardening, things like that. Um, are, are fantastic ways to then steward to take care of your soil. Yeah, moving mm. forward. Thank you so much, Brian. That was so informative. Yeah, we're learning a lot. Uh, yeah, maybe I will take. Mm, yeah, please. I like to me. chime in. Uh, yeah, please. On that, so I I think for the whole tilling thing, right? Like the initial part where you just uh dig, um, you know, it, it also it depends on the site, right? But if uh you basically dig. Uh, the, do it the first time where where you you know do it by hand and you just uh, go not too deep I think that's fine um, and then after that you just want to uh, you know maintain that the the amount of moisture and don't let it dry out and stuff like that which also kind of segues to like one of um, Brian's favorite topics which is mulching <laughs> so mulching for the beginner gardener is very important yeah. Mm. You want to give us a quick shout out on mulching? What, 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 what is mulching? Yeah, oh, Brian. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I've written oh, okay. a whole Instagram post on this, so I will not go too deep. But basically, mulching is um, you, covering mm. your soil, right? So that can be with plastic. In some cases, for certain farmers, for example, that might make more sense. But uh, my preference is always something that's biodegradable. So I like to use, if I really am in a pinch, I'll use shredded paper, which is ugly as heck, but it works. Um, alternatively, I make friends with the cleaners. Uh, when I make friends with the cleaners from a safe distance wearing my mask, right, social distancing, <laughs> um, then, then I can source dried leaves. Um, but if you are willing to, to in, again, invest, right, certain investments are worth investing in, I would say go for coconut chips or coconut, coconut core, C-O-I-R, core, core, I don't know how I'm pronouncing it, okay? But basically, it's like fibers or chips. And these look good and they are consistent. They are consistent. They give you a nice, consistent look. Um, but yeah. But basically, uh, oh dear, okay. Uh, one of the mo good functions of that is that basically it minimizes uh, evaporation. And if you minimize evaporation, the soil stays moist, which for most plants, uh, they really enjoy. Now, exceptions would be the Mediterranean plants, your rosemary, thyme, sage, oregano. Right? These are plants you <sighs> don't, don't, don't do that. Like they, will, they will rot faster. Right? Uh, and, and oh, sorry, loosely, uh, just now I mentioned a lot of stuff like, recommendations. Rather than try to grow oregano, my personal preference is to go for a, for a substitute. Find things that do well here with a similar kind of profile or mm -hmm. fragrance. So I would say that for oregano, I would say Indian borage. Uh, old folks like to call it mint, which, which is not wrong, but it's also misleading. Uh, but yeah, that kind of feathery, hairy looking mint plant that you sometimes see in community gardens, that thing is fantastic. Once established, cannot die. Mm. Yeah. Can I uh, chime in since we're on the yeah since we're on the topic of mulching and permaculture, uh, I think let's let's go back to why we need to mulch in the first place right? because we are trying to talk about permaculture and gardening with permaculture. Um, uh, in permaculture, you're always trying to mimic natural systems. Okay, so when you look at a forest, uh, the the there is a cycle of nutrients that happens from the top surface of the soil down to the bottom okay so in the tropics where we are we have a lot of rain and then there's a lot of minerals and nutrients that are soluble in water and these are basically dissolved and they flow downwards correct so in nature how nature brings that nutrients back up is that they have things called trees okay that exist in the forest and then they are the ones that have the deep root systems that absorb these nutrients, bring it up to the top of the forest canopy, uh, form the leaves, does its work, then drops down and forms oh. a layer of mulch, okay? So that's what we're talking about. So the layer of mulch is now all these dead leaves and organic material, they are high in that nutrient and minerals that have been leached down from the soil into the depths of the soil, but now brought up to the surface. And so as mm. gardeners and as permaculture practitioners, we're always trying to look at the natural systems and how can we as human beings, we might not have uh, the kind of like the perfect rainforest, but how can we try to create systems in our gardening that would uh, replicate these kind of natural systems? So you can think about growing small little trees, okay, in your garden, if you have a, a garden, uh, or even if you have a potted landscape, dedicate some space to growing trees that when you cut them, they come back very fast, mm. okay, and then we call these chop and drop. So you, you have these mm. trees that produce a lot of these nutrients, and then after that, we, we can use that as the mulch layer. 
Okay, so you cut, you drop it, mm -hmm. and then you form the mulch layer. So that's something that um, you're creating mulch on site. Uh, just another point that we can add into this mm -hmm. idea of mulch and permaculture. Okay. Thank you, uh, Alexis. No problem. Mm. If I can so, respond very briefly to some questions on mulching, uh, someone asked yep. about cardboard from eight cartons and sugarcane mulch. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, whatever anything that covers your soil fulfills that purpose of being called mulch, and in, in, in some of those functions, uh, I call them the four S's. Uh, but I don't want to take too much time now. Um, the thing is, the cardboard for egg cartons, right? Because of the cup shape to hold the eggs, um, until that breaks down, it's also going to to be storing water. So you don't want you want to be a bit careful about that. And anytime you apply mulch, you need to be very careful about water ponding. Uh, I cannot I cannot um, emphasize this enough. So that's why I really like again investing. If I can get good good nice good leaves which which are small, don't collect water, all that, that's fantastic. If not, I would say I, I think it's worth it enough to go and invest in, in the store bought product. Right? Mm -hmm. Because it, it fulfills the functions without the 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 risks that are that come with certain certain other mulches. Um, sugarcane mulch sounds fantastic and I would love to use it um, if it were commercially available, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, if you go to get sugarcane like that's been shredded by your sugarcane man, uh, it's going to have be in long stringy stuff. If you have your own garden, you're not scared of rats and anything, then go ahead. Lah. But again, you need to, especially in urban spaces, I find we need to be very aware that you know, we share the space uh, with, with our neighbours, but also with nature. So uh, we need to be very careful about pest, pest pressure once we introduce elements to the system. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So in Australia, um, you can buy sugar, sugar cane mulch and that's what I used to use. Uh, and typically it's dry it to a crisp and then they chop it up very finely. Mm. So uh, you have to kind of um, bear in mind that uh, it has to be processed in that, in that kind of way first, yeah. Mm. Okay, given the interest of time, maybe let's go to the topic of uh, pests and diseases, everyone's most hated topic. Really, really scary. Um, so do you guys have any um, like recommendations on how can we identify this pests and also how do we deal with them? Like given permaculture practices, like do you guys stay away from pesticides? Do you guys only stick to a, a few ways of like eliminating pests? Yeah, so maybe Alexis, you want to start first? by sharing with us your um, practices. Uh, I, was, I was hoping that I wouldn't start first. <laughs> Today, uh, Brian or Olivia, you guys can do it. Right? Olivia, you can start first. I Olivia, you just dealt with some, some very fun pimple popping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, please tell us a story. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the time, these pests can be seasonal. So you only see them at certain times of the year, like you maybe see them for one period and then you never see them again for quite a while. So uh, for me, I have that with grasshoppers. Uh, and then more recently, I had this, uh, what do you call that? This uh, squash beetle, uh, squash beetle larva, which is the yellow one that I was telling you guys about yesterday. That's like popping pimples, right? <laughs> <laughs> as as uh, Alexia suggested. So um, they, I, I think sometimes, of, of course, when you can actually see it, it can be a bit late. Uh, so um, my advice will always be to check the undersides of your plants from, on, on occasion. And my preferred method is really to squash it by hand. <laughs> you know? And of course, for those that, uh, where you have got maybe spider mites and you have too many to, to uh, squash, then I would suggest pruning, you know, uh, heavy pruning. And some plants can take it like, I, the one plant I always get spider mites on, not for all my plants, but for certain plants, um, would be the, the butterfly pea, which is very mm. strange. So I, I have several butterfly peas uh, at my place in different locations, and uh, some of them just always attract, you know, uh, yeah, spider mites. And I just give it a heavy prune, and that plant can take it. You know, you can basically cut it down to a stem and, and it will just like come back. Um, and of course, there are some plants that uh, will always attract, you know, uh, white fly, for example, you know, your uh, certain plants with, within the Solanacea family, the nightshade family. So uh, a lot of people will encounter white fly on their tomato plants, uh, also chili, especially. Um, and 
I I think that uh, in some people don't don't care about it. They just basically get their harvest and then they they throw out the plant. Um, and uh, for some others, they prefer to make a spray. And uh, some other people they like companion planting, which we can actually talk about as well. Um, but personally, uh, yeah, I try and get on top of it. And I know that if my soil mix is not good enough, then I will probably have the pest as pest uh, pest issues as well. So I, I think it's uh, very important to kind of if you keep having recurring pest issues uh, of this nature, so aphids, you know. Uh, and those sap sucking types, and then you have to kind of uh, pay attention. You might be overfeeding or underfeeding, could be either one. So it's a, a lesson in observation as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, over to the rest of you. Okay, so I I have uh, two points up. Uh, one is about using natural methods. So I think uh, one of the things I've learned is just maybe, okay. My personal opinion is try not to be too dogmatic about certain things. Um, like there is a place sometimes for a spray. Right. If you want to insist on not spraying, then you might not get any harvest at all. But then where you, if you are going to spray, use something that's biodegradable. So in terms of pest sprays, like mentioned by Olivia, you can try the look it up, chili and garlic uh, with a little bit of dish soap. That's one. Um, the other one would be neem oil, which you can either buy in concentrate and then dilute down, or you buy like a ready-made solution of neem oil. oil N-E-E-M. Um, so that's one thing. That's on sprays. The second thing I'll talk about is that if you're using natural methods, uh, overseas, you can do things like buy ladybirds, uh, ladybugs, and, and things like that. Uh, in Singapore, I don't know of anyone who breeds at, at the moment. So that's not necessarily an option. So let's say you want to attract a wild colony, right? Um, it's important to recognize that in order to attract the predators to come, you need enough pests. <laughs> so I think when we're a bit too proactive about kind of squashing everything, and sometimes there's a place for it, but if we are too kind of overzealous about it, then we might end up not having enough of a population to support a population of predators to come in. Um, and also, uh, on that, not everything you see in the garden that's creepy crawly, right, is a pest. It might just be, a, it might not be a creepy crawly, right, it might just be a crawly, right? Mm. Uh, one of the things that I found I, I tend to kill, used to kill very often were lacewing larva and uh, um, hoverfly larva. Things that <laughs> would take my pest and happily spray, 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 spray. Then after like years of doing research, then, oh, sh gosh, I probably killed that by accident. Um, so, uh, yeah, so not everything is a pest. Um, and then the last thing is to understand what the, what the pests are there for. I think one of the things I've learned is that um, pests are often not the problem in and of themselves, but they are symptomatic of an issue. Right? They are telling you, uh, revealing, pointing to a deeper issue that's there. Right? So yes, sometimes you need to kill the population of pests. But the, the deeper question is, why are the pests there in the first place? And, and the thing is that pests, right, are often a response to a certain stimulus. And, and that stimulus is plant stress. So when the plant is stressed, then the pests come in to take out weakness, right? Natural selection, whatever, what, what have you, right? The thing is that when plants are healthy, like a healthy human, right? They are often capable of fighting off pests to some extent by themselves. Or even if the pests are there, right? You may lose one or two leaves, but the rest of the plant is doing fantastic, right? So the question then is, why is the plant stressed? And unfortunately, that's a bit of a more, much more challenging to go and diagnose. La. Too much sun, too little sun, too much water, too little water, too much nutrients or too little nutrients, like, like Olivia mentioned. Um, but that's why like, if you understand what the plant requires and then you check what you have, then that's a quick way to do a quick check as to why the plant is stressed. La. Yeah. So if you get a plant that likes growing in, in the understory, that means under a lot of trees, right? And you give it full sun, oh, yeah, you're in for trouble. It's going to mm. die. Yeah. So that kind of example. La. Yeah. Alexis, do you have anything to add since you were tai chiing the question there? I was like, <laughs> I think uh, um, uh, pick, up, pick up a good book uh, on pests and disease. Uh, a good place to start is probably to look at how you categorize different pests and disease. Okay, so how I usually like to categorize them is uh, I categorize all my pests and disease into four categories, main categories. Okay, one is munches, those who, those pests who, who eat up your leaves, okay? Two is uh, suckers, so those pests who suck the sap of the, the plants. Okay, three is your fungus and your moles. And then after the fourth one is your viruses. Okay, so when you categorize them into these four general categories, it gives you some structure into thinking about how you're going to address them with sprays or whatever. Okay, each one of these categories, um, the insects or the animals in each of these categories, 
share certain common traits and therefore they don't like certain things. Okay, so for example, um, uh, munchers, those who eat kind of like leaves, you will notice that they get attracted to slightly sour leaves and very juicy leaves. Okay, they don't like spicy and they don't like bitter. So when you're trying to address, you know, grasshoppers, or you're trying to address like snails and stuff, okay, you can start to think about, okay, what are the things that are bitter that I can maybe try to use as a pest control? So maybe neem, you can do a, a, a infused bitter gourd juice and you can spray onto your leaves and stuff like that. And these will start to deter. Okay, so like um, then your insects that suck the, the sap, okay, most of them have breathing holes. So these are the ones that, you know, how to kill them off is to use some kind of oil-based thing. Uh, so kind of, uh, some kind of spray with oil base, and the oil will clog up these holes and then after that they cannot breathe. So uh, go and study the four different categories of pests and disease and each one of them, what do they not like? Then how to address them is to find out how can you get those things that they don't like and try to apply it to them. Uh, most of them you can find from other plants. A lot of things are found in your kitchen, like your garlics and your chilies. Okay, so try to think about all these things. Okay, that's my chip in. Oh, yes. Right. And mm. we have to talk about snails. Because someone asked about that too, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will just quickly give uh, my own solution. Uh, okay, some people like to use traps. So it could be a beer trap or you could even use pellets um, that have copper in it. Or is it iron in it? Um, mm. But uh, so personally, I go on my uh, night patrols, I try and find them, but at the same time, I use decoy plants. So um, snails like, you know, succulent leaves. And so I found that the uh, mother of thousands is extremely popular. So I uh, place them here and there. So I get an indication of when I have snails. Um, and then also they like the... Uh, Malabar spinach, and they also love longevity spinach. So if you leave this lying around, you'll find and slugs also like the longevity spinach. I think they they also like the uh, what's called um, they also they might also like the Malabar spinach. But I noticed that they like the longevity spinach. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we have three more minutes until the end of the session, respecting everyone's time. Uh, and also the questions that everyone asks, they are really good. Uh, maybe what I can do is uh, maybe on my end, I can summarize some of the uh, key points and we can post them on our Instagram page or uh, send out an email for you guys as well. So for more information on our speakers, thank you for your time. Really uh, appreciate it a lot. Love the energy. Um, so I'm, I'm plugging in uh, all their websites. Um, so Alexis has his... Um, website for his bookshops and he's got um, his Facebook page on plants I eat for his plant related questions and then also Project 33 for community events. Uh, Olivia has a, an awesome blog, uh, tendergardener.com, go check it out, there are a few great articles and also her Instagram, go stalk her, go look at her photos. Uh, Ryan, of course, he's got Ryan Gardens Adventures as well on Instagram and he has uh, very generously shared this Google Drive. Uh, which he wrote like different small articles on how do you look at composting uh, and how can you like look at certain diseases. So I think that that list will keep growing, right, Brian? Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll email you guys in the post uh, event as well. Uh, maybe I want to do a last shout out on uh, the Get Growing contest. If you guys would like to join, just all you need to do, do is to grow one edible crop and then you just have to document a few photos and then you will stand a chance to win uh, dining vouchers at a farm to fork table cafe. And also uh, we will give out like our surprise uh, slice um, presents as well. So we will be like little minions packing them and sending to you at the end of the competition. This competition will run for eight weeks. So recommend your friends. Uh, we are extending the registration until Monday for you guys and your friends. Yeah, so I'm going to plug that over here as well. Um, thank you all for joining Hayden, this. There's going to be yeah. more plant clinics coming up, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so there will be more plant clinics coming up, but we will need um, you guys to you know, give us some feedback on what do you want uh, the topics to be. So at the end of this session, there will also be an automatic link uh, to a, a survey. So help us fill, fill in what you like about the session, what you hope to uh, hope that we can you know, 
improve the session and also what you hope to see uh, being covered in the next few clinics. Yeah. Thank you so much for your uh, awesome time and energy again, Nithya, Alexis, Brian, Olivia, and everyone in this awesome group chat. So have a great uh, Saturday. Wait, can I, can I just say one last, one last thing? <laughs> of course, of course, <laughs> sorry, of course. I say a lot of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, but, sorry. Um, I would like to say that, you know, uh, one thing I've, that has stuck with me is, is that in gardening, right, it's not about if you fail, but when you fail. And I think that's very, very important to bear in mind as you go on, the, on this journey. You know, whether you're, you're a seasoned gardener or, or you, you, you are just starting or you're, you're just standing at the precipice like, oh, should I go into gardening, right? So it's not if, but when you fail. And I think when each time you fail, right, it's about like then learning, right? If, 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 if gardening is about growing, it's not just about growing veg. I think it's about growing in knowledge, it's growing in experience. And I think it's about growing in humility, recognizing that there's always something more to learn, a new system, a new thing. Uh, and then, sorry, I know I said one thing, but the second thing is, uh, as you go to different sources, right, to learn information, don't, one thing that my, my permaculture mentor, Jeremy Beckman, very cool guy, um, told me was that don't learn um, practices, don't learn specific things, right, as much as you learn principles. So even if you look at different systems, right, how, what are the principles which, which support the way they run their system? What are the principles that support the ecosystem in a certain environment? Right. Once you learn principles, right, then you can be creative and flexible about applying different things in different contexts. Right? When we become too rigid about like, oh, a permaculture garden must have a herb spiral, must have a pizza oven, must have swales or whatever, right? then we become very, very rigid and, and, and it just isn't helpful. Right? And it doesn't imitate nature, which is so different in, in different spaces. Yeah, I mean, I, I could have my whole half an hour TED talk on this, but like, yeah, I mean, yeah, so be, be prepared to fail. Each time you fail, pick yourself up and, and go again learn, do your research. And the second thing is, uh, uh, yeah, we learn, learn principles, not, not practices. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I think it's important to note that um, we can maybe, we, we can do a, thing, a lot of things by ourselves, but it, it's better to do it as part of a community. And there are so many gardeners and urban farmers out there uh, who can support your, your journey. And I would suggest joining uh, you have like Facebook groups that mm. you can join to learn things but of course you also have to connect in person and um, Foodscape Collective is a great one Alexis has a great one Project 33 which she can tell you a bit about and uh, I, I think it's important to um, meet all the because everyone knows something different right we, we don't we might know something very well but there will be somebody who will know something we don't know so it's important to get together and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Am I Chase, supposed to say any... something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do a summary. <laughs> uh, I'll follow up on Olivia's point, like just very quickly. I know there are a lot of questions. Uh, so I think finding a place where you can get your questions answered quickly is a good place. Uh, my, my, we started a Facebook group called Plants I Eat. So if you're interested and you still oh, have questions, you I can. I didn't know. Oh yeah, because we found out that Facebook has this thing called groups that allow kind of conversational things. Oh, we're gonna join um, now. So yeah, you can, exactly. Yeah, so um, we have a community of about 800 and growing and there are a lot of very good experts in it. So uh, it's kind of something like what we're doing now, but probably in a, you get a response from a community one to two days. Uh, so far it's been pretty good. It's been pretty awesome. So if you want to get your answers, uh, just post a picture of a question there and okay. then we'll try to get back Good to you. Tomatoes. Oh, fantastic. That's it. Yeah. Okay, so I uh, hope that's helpful. I think this has been awesome. I've enjoyed myself. I uh, hope the learning continues. Uh. Yes. Did there you anything, any last words? I feel oh, very lucky audience. to have um, heard from everyone, like to heard of, you know, what Alexia's, Brian and Olivia's got to share. I'm very motivated to kind of continue with my farming. Uh, I think what I'm actually very interested to hear for the next one is like a lot of this is with people like it's about soil based gardening with space right and that might not be so accessible in Singapore for everyone so I think I'd be quite curious to see like companion planting um, how do you plant in like uh, smaller spaces um, you know on, in a concrete jungle I think that'd be quite interesting very interesting maybe we can also gather to uh, Alexia's page and then we like have like 
this question today. <laughs> For sure. The you traffic will suddenly increase. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool um, though, Alexis. I've, I've actually put in some of the Facebook groups um, that were mentioned in this chat. There's Foodscape mm. Collective, Project 33, and Permaculture Singapore. If anyone's interested specifically in permaculture, it's in the chat. Um, and I mean, there are, there are lots of other groups, wow. stuff, but I don't want to cool. spam. But uh, if you have specific questions on plants, right? Um, while, we, while in permaculture, we kind of take like a more systems-based approach. If you have specific questions on plant health, NPARCS actually runs an email service. Uh, they still reply to me even in this COVID period. So that's NPARCS underscore plant info unit, right? It's there. Um, you just send a picture and then, um, or, or ask your question and they're, they're, they're usually very helpful with it. And very thorough with their replies as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Yeah. Go enjoy. Thank Have you. A, watch some movie. Enjoy. <laughs> Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks so much for hosting wait, and wait, great wait, to see you guys photo. again. Wait, take photo. Take photo. Oh, yeah, take yeah. One, two, three. <laughs> what are we supposed to <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Bye guys. Okay, okay. Bye. See you. Take bye. care. Bye.